Welcome back for uh, session two. Hope you've all had something to eat and uh, a bit of rest. And uh, like me, some taco stains on your white shirt. We're all good. So um, yeah, ready and talking about what at least some of you wanted to know. What is innovation? OK. Then do we have any thoughts? Like, what are your thoughts right now? When we hear the word innovation, what do you <coughs> think of? Anyone has any any answer is fine because it's pretty fuzzy. Anyway. Anyone? Something new. Something new. Yeah. Something developed right now. Mm -hmm. Nothing developed. I think that that's that's pretty close. It, it's kind of new, but it doesn't have to be like all new, right? Something that uh, use new mm -hmm. technologies. Sorry? It's something that progresses that use, use new technologies. Yeah, technology, uh, something new, uh, improvements. You're all onto something. I mean, could we, but, but it, it, it is a bit of, of a fussy thing. So I just thought I went out and I looked for some like, what, what are the definitions? What are people like talking about? Well, if we go like I'm a I'm a sort of a etymology nut, so I like going back. Well, what what's what the root of this word? So it's from uh, innovare, and it is to renew or make something new, like you said, something new or make something like improve something. And if you go to Wikipedia, it's the application of better solution meet that meet new requirements, inarticulated needs, or existing market needs. That's yeah. That's, I think that's close to how we use it. Uh, I think it's also interesting to see that there's a need somewhere. That'll be crucial uh, when we talk uh, later. Uh, and requirements. Because it's something that, because it, it, it ties closely to something. It's not just getting an idea that nobody cares about. Innovation has to be something that somebody cares enough about to want to buy. Back to that. Um, Brooker says realization of a good idea so that it creates profit. It is the means by which the entrepreneur either creates new wealth producing resources or endows existing resources with enhanced potential for creating wealth. So Brooker has a very clear focus on the green, making monies, billetes for you guys in Spain. Um, and it talks a lot about it's not just a good idea, but it's realizing that idea. And in a specific way, something that generates money, something that, that proves a wealth. Well, wealth can be, I, I guess you could say wealth could be uh, like a social wealth or like happiness if you're like stretching it. But I don't think that's where it's going, though. But we could still, we could still use it in that way. Fresh thinking that creates value. Richard Lyons. It's, I think, again, getting value. Value is, is, I think, more open to interpretation than um, wealth is. And I, I personally, uh, I like it, but again, it's maybe it's so fuzzy that it's we can't use it. But we'll, we'll, get, we'll get closer. <clears throat> a new product, a new service, a new production process, application, or formal organization that is launched in the market or is used in production to create economic value. And this definition is, is quite interesting for those of you who are doing things in Norway, at least, because it is from Innovation Norway. The government, government's vector for getting more entrepreneurs, new business, and new ideas to start and to survive. These are the people. I think we're getting some. We're getting somebody in from them to talk to you guys directly. But it's 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 important to know what they're looking for, because if you at any point are looking for a government grant to something that isn't a media production or a teaching tool, something that is like a technological innovation. This is the, these are people who can help you not only uh, with uh, tips and tricks and legal help and, and marketing, but also directly with funds from the government. Because it's 
good idea to have a look at that. Also, it's very concrete, right? This is a bit more sort of fuzzy, but here's some, there are some examples in here. A new service, a new production process. I think this one is, is quite interesting. You're making the same thing, but you're making it in a new way. Hopefully, you know, either it improves quality or it's cheaper or something like that, right? Not just cutting edge technology, but the application of techniques, ideas, and discovery of new markets. That's sort of my sort of distilling that into uh, something that what, what I, I think we often forget when we talk about innovation. It's a technique and a discovery of a new market. That's also an innovation. Finding out that, you know, um, I like to use an example of the Wii. You know, coming from games and all. Um, at some point, the console business, video game consoles were sold to stereotypically uh, young white men. And that was the market. And that was when you had Nintendo has been in that market for a long time. And then uh, at one point, um, Nintendo wanted to make a CD-ROM console, and they wanted to compete with uh, Sega, who was in that niche as well. And they did. They, Nintendo went together with Sony to do that, but they fell out, fell out with each other. And then Sony made the PlayStation, and the Dreamcast came, and they did. But they're all competing in that same market. And when Microsoft comes in, that market is very. Uh, but it, it, it's a lot of competition there. And Nintendo says, okay, we can try to compete here, or we could do something else. We can uh, make a Venn diagram and say, everybody in the world, and how many people are, you know, young white guys, and how many of those play video games? And so do we want to carve out like our piece there? Well, I don't know. Games can be fun for like other people too, can't they? What about all the rest of these? So what they did instead was to find a new market, expand that market. Nintendo players. And suddenly the Nintendo Wii exploded. And that's an innovation. They did something, not with technology, because Nintendo, we'll get back to that in, I think, the second lecture. Nintendo uses old technology, but in new ways, which is also an innovation. And they use old technology in new ways with new people. And that's also an innovation. So don't feel constrained by you guys being um, IT nerds, right? Don't, don't, you're computer science people. But your innovation doesn't have to be the technology. The thing is, you have an ideal opportunity because you're inside the technology to see where the technology maybe doesn't fulfill people's needs in a way that you can take some technology that already exists and do that. OK, let's have a, have a look here. Um, IDEO um, has made this interesting. Uh, they also like Venn diagrams, just like me. And um, what you have here three, if you say, domains or factors that contribute to innovation. You have business or viability. That is, can you sell this thing? And then you have the technology. I think you guys are probably very familiar with technology and innovating in this domain. I think that's that's not a problem. You know what it means when technology improves. Technology, technology when, when, when a good idea is transformed into a piece of technology. I think that that's, that's I don't think that's a problem. Feasibility, can we do it? You know, is it possible to make this thing? And then there's a third part of innovation, which is people. Desirability. Does anybody want this? Does anybody feel like this is going to make my life better? This is going to be like, wow, Jesus, I need this thing. 
could be a need that they already knew they had and they've been asking for it for years because just nobody uh, took them seriously or had the thing, the technology to do it. It could also be something that they didn't know. But when you see it, it's like, I want this. I need this. Okay? And you can see where these uh, domains uh, overlap, you have different types of innovation. Um, if you have something that you can sell and people want it, that's it's, or you can sell it being, means that you can produce it cheaper than you need to sell it. Because if you can make something, but it costs you more to make it than you can sell it for, that, that's not really a viable, right? So if you, you can innovate here. You can innovate by making marketing in a new way, by making new relationship with customers, by uh, branding, by saying like, like making differentiating based on emotions. In this space over here, you innovate on process. You have something that you know you have. You're just trying to make something that, that runs smoother. That cuts a bit of that cuts some uh, unnecessary steps in the process. That goes it just just does something faster. And here, in functional innovation, where people and technology mean just making something that's easier for people, something that has a or something that has a, a functionality that that's just better. That this seems more. Um, to, let's take let's see see if we can find some. Um, examples um do you guys all know what tupperware is tupperware you know, plastic boxes you put food in there you put a lid on it and it stays fresher for longer you don't have to throw it away right away right exactly so it's tupperware originally it was made and didn't sell so well. Do you have any, have any ideas to who it was marketed for at first? This was marketed towards restaurants and big kitchens because you know they have always have leftovers and have to put it somewhere. Turns out they weren't so interested. And if you're going to buy a lot of those, going to cost you as much as throwing away food doesn't matter and and people if you if you have a restaurant especially a high-end restaurant you want to sell like fresh stuff well like if somebody sees you dragging that out how long has that been in there you don't know also it's a bit of a, a business which it's in, in some ways is a bit um, a bit conservative the other market, other potential market, that was at that time when they came out was housewives. Housewives are also very conservative. And if you want to sell something to housewives, you can't just put ads out. Does anybody have any idea as to how Tupperware changed that? I'm uh, not sure, but I think they sort of had those gatherings where they sort of got people together and they showed off their products and got people interested by doing that. Exactly. And that was, and how they did that, that's the interesting part. That's the innovation. That's because they did that at somebody's home. It's a home party at some other housewife's home. And she can tell you, look at these. The things you eat, you know, the, those cakes you're eating right now, I made those the day before yesterday, and they taste just as good now. And look at this one. I use that for, and she starts talking about how she uses it. And word of mouth, other people having used something, that creates some trust. That's, that's, a, that's a vector for, uh, for reaching this usually quite conservative group of consumers. So you had something that was technologically feasible that was... You could make it at a reasonable price, at least uh, for housewives. Also, there's something emotional. You know, you don't want to throw away food. If you're a restaurant owner, you've been throwing away food for 20 years. You don't care anymore. But you have a housewife. Shit, you know, I made that. I put my love into these uh, 
Belgian waffle, they don't want to throw them away. It's different. more for it than it costs to make, and then you just make it desirable by by leveraging a new relationship, a new way of marketing and branding this thing. Um, let's say Apple, Apple iPhone. When I bought my first Apple iPhone, my wife was like, why would you buy that thing? It's more expensive than mine. Its camera is worse than mine. Its processor is worse than mine. And it doesn't even have a keyboard. Why would you buy that stupid? I mean, why, why would you buy that thing? Because, I said, it's easier to use. But you're an IT nerd. You can use any of these. Yes, yes, but I don't want to. I just want to go into the App Store and press that icon, and then I have it. But you have to pay for those. I can download them on the internet, and they're free. Yes, but you have to download them. And there's a tar ball that you have to unpack, and then you have to put it into your telephone, and then you there's some weird menu that has 15 levels, and then you go in, and then you find it. Whereas on my phone, it just now pops up there. It's easier to use. And she thought I was stupid. And then at some point, she borrows it, and the day after, she goes out and she buys an iPhone. Technology, I mean, we already have old technology, and well, it's, they, they sold it pretty, you know, expensively, and it was must have been rather cheap to make because, you know, it was worse than hers in every conceivable way, except, you know, that thing that actually counts, that you would use it and, and like it. And they just innovated here with functional innovations. It's easy, it's better to use. It feels more intuitive. I, I would say that right now my, my latest iPhone is gone like it, it's it's more complicated. You have to know more things. You're like holding down buttons and, and things and lots of shit that, that that's not and, and as intuitive as the first one. But and I, and I also think that uh, for you um, interaction design people, the skeuomorphism that was very a big part of the first uh, design um, sort of look of the iPhone is a very important factor to its success. Skeuomorphism, by the way, is that it looked like, things looked like fall leather, and buttons looked like buttons you could actually, like, like they, they were bulging, you could press them. Whereas now they're more like iconography, like they're more um, abstract. But I think that, that things looked like a button if you could press it, and things looked like a zipper when you open it. That was good. That made a lot of people who would have never used all of those weird functions on my wife's super expensive, weird at that time, Nokia, that was something accessible to them. But that's also an innovation. That's a super important innovation. That's an innovation that changed the market for mobile phones. Do you have any, any of you can think of anything you could like put in here? Any ideas? Oh, do I have any ideas? Yeah. Let's move on. Let's, let's let's think about that one for a while. But I think the, the basic thing here is that it, it doesn't have to be here, right? A way, another way of making it, another way of selling it, another way of making a relationship with the customer. That's also innovation, and I'm pretty sure that. Because I think most of you are firmly grounded here. With the interaction design, it goes a bit more toward here. Um, often it, it helps by just thinking, how would I want to buy this thing? How, do, how would I just produce this? Does this make sense the way it is today? And then thinking, based on that, is there an innovation hiding in there? Um, so, we're going to talk a bit about creativity, get some tools, uh, and, and get rid of some misconceptions about creativity. How many of you in here today, how many of you like, feel like you're creative? Because you can say that like, some people have, like, I'm a right brain, and I'm left brain. Left brain is, is, is like super mathematical, and right brain is creative, isn't it? Not that that's 
that, that, that's not correct, by the way. But uh, a lot of people sort of lump themselves and others into like creative or more like mathematical guys. How many people here feel that you know I'm creative? It's like three and a half guys, three and a half of us think we're creative. I think that's very uh, <clears throat> that's very common when we in, in, a, in an institution like this. And if we go to the uh, to an art school, they're all gonna raise their hands and say they're creative, even if they're not. Um, but I think for people who are not used to working creatively, uh, there are some misconceptions about creativity. And uh, I'm going to try to, try to tackle them here. Um, and if we're lucky, I can even show you a video. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, has anybody seen the Dead Poet Society? Two? <laughs> it's a fantastic film. You have to, you, you should uh, see it. Let's see if there's a uh, sound on this thing. Oh, God's sake. What do I have to do to get that? Uh, it, it, so you I have that. You have to go. But uh, it goes in there. But what does it come out? <laughs> I'm sort of assuming. Oh, I was now assuming that there must be some loudspeakers if there is a like a, 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 a mini jack. Yeah. But I can tell you right away, assumption is the mother of all fuck ups. Never assume. Oh, it comes out of there. Yeah. Okay, but that, that, oh, let's turn it, crank it up, I think. Okay, it's right there. The opening paragraph of the preface, entitled Understanding Poetry. Understanding Poetry by Dr. J. Evans Pritchard, PhD. To fully understand poetry, we must first be fluent with its meter, rhyme, and figures of speech, then ask two questions. One, how artfully have the objective of the poem been rendered? And two, how important is that objective? Question one rates the poem's perfection. Question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple matter. If the poem's score for perfection is plotted on the horizontal of a graph, and its importance is plotted on the vertical, then calculating the total area of the poem yields the measure of its greatness. A sonnet by Byron might score high on the vertical, but only average on the horizontal. A Shakespearean sonnet, on the other hand, would score high both horizontally and vertically, yielding a massive total area, thereby revealing the poem to be truly great. <laughs> As you proceed through the poetry in this book, practice this rating method. As your ability to evaluate poems in this manner grows, so will, so will your enjoyment and understanding of poetry. Excellent. That's what I think, Mr. J. Evans Pritchard. We're not like pipe, we're talking about poetry. How could you describe poetry like American bandstand? Well, I like Byron, I give him a 42, but I can't dance to it. Now, I want you to rip out that page. Mm -hmm. Rip out the entire page. Here, man. Rip it out. Rip it out! Come on. Rip it out! Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Gentlemen, tell you what, not just tear out that page, tear out the entire introduction. I want it gone. History, leave nothing of it. <laughs> Rip it out. Rip. Be gone, J. Evans Pritchard, PhD. Rip. Spread the tears. Rip it out. I want to do nothing but ripping of Mr. Pritchard. We'll separate it. Put it on a roll. That's the Bible. You're not going to go to hell for this. Make a clean tear. I want nothing left of it.
I don't hear enough ring. Just keep it. Look out of there. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you were here. I am. Oh. So you are. Excuse me. Keep ripping, gentlemen. This is a battle. A war. And the casualties could... Yes. Well, anyway, I hope that was um, educational. Um, and uh, so that, that's and, and, and the thing is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that kind of teacher. I wish I was sometimes, but I'm not. So I'm going to go in the opposite direction, and and uh, and then you can rip that out of your heads or something some later. But I'm going to do the same with ideas. I'm going to be a Mevin's Pritchard PhD for ideas. And uh, uh, while I do think it's, you know, again, it's a model, and models are uh, uh, a simplification. Sometimes a model like this, for the kinds of heads that I think many of us have in this room, uh, just quantifying it, in, in this case, through a uh, Cartesian coordinate system, can be helpful. So, what's a good idea? I, I made this graph, and this and, and label this axis quantity and this quantity, and they are logarithmic. So, this step here, this step here is ten times that step there. Just so you know. And on this. So, so that means that in quantity here, we have a 10-minute sample. So that's not much. It's a 10-minute sample of whatever you're making. Again, here it's developed. This model here has been developed for games specifically, but it kind of, kind of applies to other things. So and here we have a representative experience. In game um, development, we often call that a vertical slice. It's something that is has everything. Think of it as a vertical slice. You can think of it as a piece of cake. The cake, the slice of cake has everything. It has the frosting, it has the sugar bread, and it has the cream and everything in it, but it's just a slice. And the rest of the cake is what we promise to make once we have all the money. But we show you the vertical slice and say, hey, why don't you taste this? That's a representative experience. Sometimes it's hard to make without making the whole cake. But that's just how life is. Then a full game, in case of a game. But it could also be, in case of a book, a seven-part epic about a bespectacled boy who lives under the stairs of his uh, muggle parents and, and feels like he doesn't belong because he belongs in a mystical, magical fantasy land. Okay. But that is a lot of work. But this is not so much. Okay? And then on the quality axis. Now this is quite controversial because I'm saying something is higher quality the more realized it is. The lowest quality idea you can have is an idea that's just in your head. Now if you take a bit of work and you write it down, document it, that, that's, that's better. That's a higher quality idea in my system, which you might want to rip out of your heads afterwards. I'm not making any guarantees. If you implement that idea, if you make an actual prototype of some sort, then that idea is obviously better. Why is it better? Because you can make that. This idea, you have no idea if you can make it or not. When you write it down, then you find some holes that, you didn't, that your idea didn't have when it was in your head. Everything that's in your head is perfect. It's like when you're dreaming and it doesn't, you know, you're walking down the street with your girlfriend and then suddenly your mom. Oh, never mind that. Your head does that with your ideas all the time. Oh, yeah, I'm going to make this, this huge service where, you know, you're connecting with people and, uh, but wait a minute. If you're connecting with people over that service, isn't it just like Facebook? Yeah, never mind that. That's my mom. Your, your head does that all the time. 
And you find some of those holes when you document it. You find most of those things when it's implemented. But you'll find even more once you test it. So an idea that you've documented, implemented, and tested, that's a good idea. Everybody can see that's a good idea. Once you've polished it, once you've taken everything that can, can be improved and made it better and saved a lot of feedback from lots of people, you've had it out in the marketplace, and you fixed it, and it goes, yes, that's a fantastic idea. It's a great idea, but of course they would make money off of that idea. It's such a fantastic, I mean, of course you should sell Tupperware at home parties. That's how you reach that demographic. Everybody can see it's a good idea when you've perfected home parties into what it is, or today is kind of weird, though, maybe, isn't it? <laughs> but but still, to what it was in its heyday. Once Apple has made you know a touch screen that just feels intuitive with 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 when you're moving things around, it follows your finger and you can pinch to zoom and all that. Of course, once it's polished, everybody can see it's a good idea. Once it's here, it probably wasn't. Once it was in somebody's head over at Apple, it probably wasn't a good idea because he hadn't documented and said, oh shit, oh, we have that problem. We're gonna move things when you use two fingers. Uh, okay, to rotate, I don't know. But you find some solution. Put that in and people say, I can't understand this stuff. And you fix that, you test it, and you make it so that it's perfect. So when you, when you move something in the wrong way on the screen, it's not, you can over drag it, but you're dragging it less and less and less until it stops. When you move the image the wrong way and it's sort of bouncy, you don't, you don't notice that, haven't you? If you have a touch screen phone, it's like, my God, I hope you all have one. <laughs> if not, are you like, like, I don't know, cavemen or women? Uh, but, but right, but you, you're pulling it the wrong way and it starts bouncing. That effect, that doesn't come by accident. That effect is not something you will make in your head the first time you think, oh, I think it would be cool to, just, to, to, to use the touch screen. That's something you usually don't find unless until you get here. And it doesn't feel good until you're there. And that's when I say, now that's a good idea. And then I'm going to go and say, Having something, a seven part epic, a huge piece of like, like documented, some of it's documented, but most of it's just in your head. That's worthless. But that's often where I, I, I've taught a lot of game design students, and a lot, a lot of game design students, but they do, they want to design games, but they don't necessarily want to make graphics for games, and they don't necessarily want to program games. So they'll just stay at this level, documenting stuff. Documenting maybe half of the stuff that goes in the game. And the rest is, I got that in my head. Don't worry about that. Unfortunately, this document, as they struggle with getting people excited about their idea, the document grows, but the level of implementation, the quality doesn't. So it's, it's stuck here. And unfortunately, nobody pays anything for that. That's the kind of idea you can't sell to anyone. However, if you make a 10 minute sample of something that is fantastic because you've documented it, you've implemented it, you've tested it a couple of times on your friends and your family and then some guy on the street and some people who were just stupid enough to sit next to you uh, in, in a bar and they hated it, so you fixed it and now it's polished and now it's Oh, really good. If that's just 10 minutes, that is essential to selling it to somebody, to getting other people interested and saying, hey man, that game you made, that's just fantastic. That's super. Let's make a seven part epic up of that. You made it. If you had just one level of Angry Birds, people understand what Angry Birds is about. So you can have Angry Birds Star Wars, and you can have Angry Birds in Hell, and Angry Birds Mio, and whatnot. I don't think Angry Birds in Hell is there, but it's a good idea, <laughs> right? But that having something that's implemented, that's, that, that's really critical to getting people involved and excited 
about that idea. There's a saying that uh, a million monkeys, can anybody finish that? What's the saying? A million monkeys. <laughs> Close enough, if it's not a keyboard. It, 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 okay, let's say if they were in the, the, the last century. It wouldn't be a keyboard, it would be a typewriter, yes. A million monkeys and a million typewriters will eventually uh, make Shakespeare. Or eventually write Hamlet, it says here. And then it's, I think this was funny. From an evolutionary standpoint, hasn't that already happened? Um, but that's the thing. Three wonderfully written pages. Like something that is like a 10 minute sample of something that is really good. That's easy to evaluate. And once you flip that third page of that, let's say it's a novel or something. One dark and stormy night. Okay, you probably shouldn't that way. That's probably not good. I'm not, I, I don't write novels. But something that really sounds great. And you flip that first page. And by that page, you know everything. You know that you can see the place in your head. By the, by the time you flip the second page, you you know the character, the central character is involved, and what's at stake. And then you flip the. There's nothing else. See, I want more. You're desperate for more. Once you flip that third page, and the thing that if that was good. That reader is going to expect something, the next piece to be even better because you're building up to something good. What they have in their head is going to be even better than what you could have written if you had like somebody just made you write, write the fourth page. That fourth page in their head is going to be really fantastic. However, seven volumes of half-baked ideas with some flat characters and plot hooks and plot holes, that's just hell that's nobody wants to read that why would anyone want to read that um I, i've submitted plot sometimes uh for games and you have to be very careful not to outline like the whole story of the game and all the characters and everything that's going to happen and then this level and that level because that's just really I mean, that's really low on the quality scale. It's just it's like bad documentation. And there's a lot of it. If you instead just make one piece, one level, that's really great. And somebody can play it. And if they don't want to play it, if, like, if you have to send it out of the house to somebody who doesn't really play their games that much, then you make a video out of that. And that video, <laughs> even if you have... 30 minutes of gameplay. You shouldn't put 30 minutes of gameplay in that video. 30 minutes of like a, a, an alpha build of a game, that's, that's really, that's not something most people want to watch. And especially if you're the head of some publishing company, you don't want to see that. You want to see 30 seconds with lots of cuts and lot, just the, the most exciting stuff and with uh, great voiceover and something that just really Hits you, and it's the same thing if it's a product that connects people. You want to see people connecting. Get somebody to show, get somebody to pretend that they're using it in a situation that's normal. Like what we did in mobile tech, where we had a new customer uh, who was using it. One of the things we did was make a publishing platform. So you could publish, because newspapers have. Uh, lots of software they use to publish uh, onto um, their paper pages. And some also had systems that would publish both to the web and to the pages. And we then offered a solution where you could also publish on mobile. And we could, we, we could talk about that for ages and show them graphs and show them all the things that we had and the systems. And you'd normally not get a sale with that. However, if we just grabbed graphics off of their website and cut some shit out of the newspaper and put it in, just so that it seemed to work on a very superficial level, and then create four databases with just placeholder information that you could get when you were searching and whatnot, 
and then and when you met an executive from a newspaper and they was like, well, what kind of stuff do you have for us? What, what can you offer? And it's like, I don't know, something like this maybe? And they would have something that looked like their newspaper on a surface level only, but still on the mobile. Something they had never seen before. This could be how your newspaper is on the mobile. And they could click stuff and they could go deeper and they could surf to search for something. Of course, the search results would just be bogus. But that's not the point. They could do that and see all the functionality, and that's very easy for them to say, yes, we want this. The idea, as we understand it is normally, is the same, right? How about publishing directly to mobile when, within the same system that you do uh, when you publish to, to paper, newspaper, and web? Right? That, that's the same idea. But how we show it makes all the difference. Something somebody can interact with on this phone right now, which looks like a finished product, or lots of graphs and numbers, and I use a flip over and things. One of them is not going to get anybody excited, and the other one is. Because that thing, unfortunately, is unreadable. I mean, you will not get any. Um, I have a lot of friends who work in uh, publishing. And I can tell you right away if you're going to send something to them and get up, like if you have an idea for a book or something, and if you send this, if it is, in fact, wonderful written pages, they'll either say, Yes, we want to publish your book, or they'll say, It's not for us, but you should talk to somebody else. They'll refer you to somebody else. Same things with in the game business. I think even more in the game business, they'll they'll send you to. If Sony doesn't want it, then they'll send you to Nintendo. They're, they're pretty nice guys in that respect. Uh, <clears throat> however, if anybody gets this, I, I I don't think you get. I think now it's a bit different, but back in like ten years ago, publishers would get this kind of stuff, like a huge tome of half baked stuff all the time, and it would be in an executive's hands for as long as it took to take it, for as long as it took for them to take it out of the envelope and over to the garbage can because it's just not interesting it's just it's just not something you can engage with because quantity only requires time making stuff on that axis over here that only takes time. You only have to use more time, more time to get something, to get further along that axis. Whereas quality requires that you, not only you have skills and you are able to employ techniques, but you are able to improve your skills and improve your techniques as you go. You'll be better for each step you take up here, right? And hopefully, you have some of those skills, and you have some of those techniques, and you will learn some of the others. And that goes a bit back to what I said in the beginning after we had, you know, had the presentation round. Find out. Don't be shy. Find out what are your skills? What are you good at? What are the techniques you know? What tools do you know? And then also, by knowing that, you'll know what tools you don't know, what skills you should have wished you had. And if you want to, you can improve those, or you can try to hook up with other people who do have those skills and who do know those tools, and you'll help each other out, which is crucial when you're making a business, is to have other people that do things that you can't do. Be something, you know, just to be a bit, uh, call it yeah Floske. I don't know what that is either. but it's be something larger than yourself I don't even know what it is in English sorry <laughs> but um, do you have any comments to my uh, my beautiful uh, model I mean I'm very open to uh, criticism but does it make sense I mean it's not the way we talk about quality normally 
the quantity I think is, is fine. But but uh, does it make sense to you? Simon, you're always, you know, you're a what's fast, well, I, but I, as they I say in Denmark. Call it tangibility rather than quality. Um, because it, in your head, it's not tangible, right? It's yeah. intangible. Mm -hmm. And when it's only written down, it's still not really a thing yet. Yeah. Right? It's only the description of a thing. Yeah. Implemented is a thing, but not a very good thing yet. Yes. Tested then. So, so the first part, like the first part of mm -hmm. that move is about making something tangible. Yes. The second half of the y axis is about making it better. Yep. So it's almost kind of a two stages. Make it tangible. It definitely it is, and, and I think I think you're very right. And I think the, the the core part of it was to just to say that it is intrinsically linked with what we perceive as something that's good. At least if you want to use qualitative measures on it, people can't argue with the success of something that's you know everyone can see that that's good. Me measuring the quality of but, an idea is very difficult. Yes, it is. But if you, when you done it, when you have, if you have a lot of it, and you, are, it's very high up here. It's the greatness of the quality. Oh. Anyway, will be huge. Um, let's uh, try to move on to getting ideas. Getting ideas is something that um, I think a lot of people who don't work creatively think see as something that's a bit mysterious, mystical, magical thing. That how do you get your ideas? I think that's one of the things that uh, writers, uh, game developers, uh, a lot of people who work in the creative industry, they get that question. Where do you get your ideas from? Um, and, and personally, I really like this Calvin and Hobbes script here. Uh, where do you have an idea for your story yet? No, no, I'm, I'm waiting for inspiration. You can't just turn on creativity like a faucet. You have to be in the right mood. And, and, and what mood is that? Last minute panic. Um, at least it is very. It rings very true to me. Um, um, there's a Donald Norman. You probably know Donald Norman. Uh, Donald Norman is, is sort of the usability uh, interaction design guru. Um, I, I'm very fond of Don Norman myself, even though I skipped all the classes with him when I was uh, taking my bachelor, but then I took my master and then I rediscovered him again. But he says, stress, that gives you focus, which is why you have deadlines. Right? That's when, you, when you're stressed, you only see the thing in front of you, which is good for getting stuff done, but it's not very good for seeing possibilities. Whereas in a relaxed atmosphere, that results in creative solutions. When you're sitting down with your best friends, or maybe not your best friends, your most creative friends, your people that, that listen to you and you listen to them, and, and have a beer, that's when you get the creative <laughs> solution. So it's coffee, beer. I think you're gonna, if you want to simplify it, coffee, beer. Um, and you can get them anywhere. The bus to work, and when you get them in the shower, you get them in the bed with your sweetheart, which is normally, I would advocate, once you get your idea, write it down right away. But maybe not in this case. Right? If you're in the middle of something, yeah, you have to wait for and against. Maybe it could even be good if you just keep, hold that thought. <laughs> Depending on this. And the ideas can be for new technology, can be for new experience, a new delivery method, a revenue model. Maybe it's a new brand identity. And when do you get those? You go, you get those ideas when you go and grab it. You have to put yourself in a mindset that you feel creative. Sometimes, because this, these, all these things, these are the ones where they're very low here. It's just in your head. You have to go and be determined to go and grab your, squeeze your creativity and see, okay, push it. Let's see, the moment, okay, I have this idea, it's in my head, let's write it down. And then you show it to somebody, and then you keep writing, and then you keep, like I just talked about, develop your idea. And the more you do that, the more often 
and the better your ideas will be. The more often you get your ideas, and the better the ideas you get will be. It's, it's a bit of a, like, yeah, you just have to train. I don't think, I, I don't think it's like a physiological difference between creative people and non-creative people, if you want to say it that way. Um, <laughs> as it's often portrayed in the, oh, brain, right brain, half, left brain, half. It's just in structures, ways you tend to think. And um, it's about being creative on demand. That, that's, that's a hard part for a lot of people. I'm, I'm one of my friends, uh, her, one of her colleagues, so it's a second-hand knowledge. But um, he was creative in the bath, right? So, so he, he would have bath. And then discovered he was having too many baths and found that he was just as creative that he went and sat in the bath fully clothed. So um, it was the environment that didn't actually need the water. So it didn't need to be immersed in water to be creative. He just needed to be in that space. And so he would go and sit in a bath with a pad and write down his ideas, because that's where he was. So, so in a bathtub without bathtub. any water in it. Yeah, in a bathtub with no water in it, fully clothed. And that was, that was enough trigger for him to be creative. So when he needed to be creative on demand, he would go and find a bathtub. <laughs> Which is, you know, so you know, if you if you find something that triggers you, yeah, 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 it can be odd, but that's that's. I think it is that way with us people that we we have these uh, things that trigger different moods, different states of mind. And if you are, if you need, if you need to take that beer, by all means, take that beer. If you need to sit in the bathtub, sit in the bathtub. Just be aware that there's some, you know, sometimes. Uh, like, you know, if you want to be creative in a board meeting, bringing a bathtub may not be <laughs> the most efficient way of, of, of going about things. And and if you need a beer every time, you just to get your courage up to speak, uh, again, that board meeting may get a bit weird towards the end. Norwegians seem to be re relatively grumpy about drinking before 12. Yes, I don't, I, well, I've... I've been working in, in Denmark and, and uh, in Germany for many years, so uh, I, 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 I find that strange. Uh, why, would, <laughs> why wouldn't you drink? Why wouldn't you? Why, why wouldn't you? But this is a cultural thing, and it's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, whatever it takes. But, yeah, I mean, we are creatures of habit, as you say, so you can train yourself to be creative in that particular space. So he mm -hmm. trained himself be creative in the you know bathroom in the bathroom and that's where he became creative like if he used an office space he would be as well creative in the office space so i think that's that's it that's could be a topic for another lecture like how do you change your habits and how do you change your uh, it's uh i'll really quickly touch on it that sometimes you, you a habit usually consists of, of, of two of these two parts one is the trigger and then is the action yes it's like when you get up, you wake up in the morning and you feel like, oh, I, you know, I just want to sleep 10 more minutes. But then the action you take, that is rolling around, hitting snooze, rolling around and sleeping 10 more minutes. The, the interesting thing is you can change that habit by keep the trigger, the trigger is fine, just do something else with it. Just, oh, I, you know, I really want to sleep for 10 more minutes. And the moment you feel that, you jump up out of your bed. And you go and take a shower. If you do that, that will be your habit from now on. It takes a bit of time, a bit of effort the first couple of times, but then that's your habit. You can't really change your triggers because what you feel is what you feel, but you can't change what you do with it. Anyway, so over back to creativity on demand. Um, there's a guy called Edward de Bono uh, who has. Um, Done a lot of research on creativity and uh, written some pop smart books about creativity, and uh, I want to introduce you to some of that uh, today. And he says, creative creative thinking means going from asking what is to asking what can be. And he has um, he has a he has a I think he has a problem. When it comes to creativity, at least, with the uh, classic Western ideal from uh, Plato 
um, Socrates, Aristotle, Aristotle, where you have an argument to find out what the truth is. Um, how is it with you guys? Have you taken uh, some Schulbreden? Uh, I don't know what, what is that. Is it like a epistemology course? Any time? I know at the university you have to take a sort of epistemology course before you get in Schulbreden. Is that something that you get at the college, university college as well? Well, we're now at university, and we're still discussing whether or not that's going to be required. Uh -huh. So, um, but the colleges generally haven't. I kind of touch on it occasionally in game design, but not really at a, a systematic level. So, yeah. um, the theories of knowledge is not something that most most of our our students will have done. Okay. Um, the international students, though, probably yeah. were forced. The German students, you know, mm -hmm. German philosophers are kind of you know a big deal. So I would have thought you guys might have been forced to fall in love with your German philosophers, no? Not really. No, but it's fine. No. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but the whole idea with how you find truth in that sort of um, in, in that tradition is arguing against each other. Okay, we have like a fuzzy area of contention. Right? You're saying one thing. She's saying something else. How do you find out? The truth is in there somewhere. Somewhere in there is like a nugget of truth, right? That's the idea we have. So she's arguing for her side, you're arguing for your side, and when you're moving in towards this, you know, into this nebulous thing, and then finally do, you hit on something. You hit on something that you argue against each other, and you find the truth. You find something like that. Yeah, like the hypothetical deductive method. How do you go about doing science, right? However, the problem is, with creativity, you want to do something else. Because you can't get out. What about everything that's outside there? You, you don't want to find the truth, something that already exists somewhere. You want to make something new. That means you have to move instead of going. Hold on. Try and grab that. You don't want to go in here from different points to find something know the truth in there you want to take go from something that is and go out in many directions looking for something that could be out here that's what creativity is about is in finding the new something that hasn't been realized in some way before which means you have to think with each other in parallel, but in alternating directions. So it's not like I'm arguing here and she's arguing there, nor is it I'm going to go for this and you're going to go for that and no, we'll see you later. But let's both explore this route here. Let's explore as much of this area here as we can and find out, well, there's, I don't know, maybe there's something here, peace. That we can put in there, and that becomes that piece. Now let's explore this route here, this area here. And well, what, what do you know? We found another piece. And that goes in there. And exploring together, growing together, covering more ground until we find something that maybe it wasn't even there. We have to piece it together from somewhere else. Okay. Now it's all getting a bit sort of fuzzy, and we're Maybe, uh, maybe I'm letting the model get the better of me, but that's the whole idea that we're thinking together. And what the Bono developed was uh, an idea he called the six hats. And the six hats are six positions or ways of thinking um, that people will naturally gravitate towards um, in a discussion. And what he's talking about here is creativity. I think. That, that, I think I have to stress that before I go into it, is that we have this idea of people being creative, creative genius, gets an idea on his own in the bathtub. But very often, great ideas like these aren't born in the bathtub, they're born together with other people. They're born out of a discussion between the three of us, 
like uh, the uh, pickled cauliflower, <laughs> which we would uh, innovate by selling in Poland. And so the, that was the going back to the model we had with feasibility, viability, and desirability. As uh, Vune mentioned, that his was it his father made uh, pickled cauliflower. And that's something that people make in Norway, but it's not like huge, because you know pickled pickled stuff isn't like big in Norway. But in Poland, pickled pickled stuff, anything pickled is enormous. You guys think you're crazy about pickled pickled stuff, but you hadn't heard of pickled cauliflower. So the idea then would be to take something. That already exists and innovate by releasing in a different market. That could be an innovation. That could be a thing. And that happened because he's Polish and Vuna's father pickles stuff. And I was just happened to sit there and connect some dots. And then we talked about it and thought, hmm, that could be a good idea. And but a lot of really good ideas happen when. You're together with people, and this is a tool for thinking better creatively with other people. Thinking creatively alone is harder. I don't have a like a super uh, super technique for that, but at least this works when you're talking. Because a lot of times, what often happens is somebody comes and I have this great idea, and somebody else says, I don't know about that. Uh, he always comes along with his bright ideas, thinks he's so bloody smart. Let's try to pick that thing apart. And then you have a third person who's like, oh my god, they're going at it again. I just have to like, like pour some oil on these waters, try to like keep it civil. And they're using all their cognitive powers to keep these people from flying at each other's throats. That's not a good way of being creative. But naturally, people gravitate towards some of these decisions. And the first one, the positive optimistic, the yellow hat, is all about <clears throat> having a good feeling about a product. Saying, well, yeah, I'm really optimistic about this. I, it, there's, it's, it's, you know, it's very constructive. It's uh, all that you're speculating about how all the possibilities that are in this idea or in this product or whatever we're working with. Positive, optimistic. All, what, what's good about this? And very often, somebody else will fall into that trap, if you will, with the classic Western discussion, you're arguing against each other. So if somebody's so super optimistic about something, that means I have to take this position. The black hat, the negative critical. Talking about why, why won't it work? It's logical, it's not emotional, and it has reasons given for all the everything, but it challenges the yellow hat. It challenges everything that positive. Yeah, well, you can say that it's uh, like say for if you've used the uh, Apple iPhone again. Yeah, yeah, it's it's easier to use, but all grandmas they don't want to pay three hundred dollars for a phone anyway. Always good reasons. All, always founded in something, but you're challenging everything. Like, well, it's easy to use, but is it that easy? Is it easy enough? Always challenging, being negative and critical. Mm -hmm. The creative and generative, the green hat, is also a position a lot of people will take, where they say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. And it has a touch screen, and it could also have a gyroscope, and what if it also you one of those IR ports, you could use it uh, for your TV, and you watch TV there, while you're also watching another program there, you could, and, and then, they, they can talk, but they can always talk like over radio waves, and you should put a radio in that thing. And you know what? It gets really hot now. What do you do? You should like to, you know, heat your coffee cup. You put it under your coffee cup, and hey, 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 you're generating a lot of ideas. Typical reaction to that is, that's stupid. We don't want that. That heat there is going to make that battery overload. It's going to, you know, melt. 
But the creative generative, a lot of people, the moment they start hearing about a product or an idea is they will add their own stuff into it. Their own ideas will come flowing. Some of them will be a really good fit for that product. Some of them will be just crazy shit, which you do not want in a product, which is maybe the opposite of what you're trying to do. But people will try to put features in, but that's fine. This, that's just a position that people set. A lot of people will just say, okay, okay, all that's fine. You have these, yeah, you some good things, some bad things, some other ideas. Let's just take an overview. Let the, the blue hat is up in the sky. It's just taking, let's get, let's, let's see here now. Okay, let, let's keep it the group focused. Let's, uh, let's, let's just use what we have here and, and focus. Try to see how, how can we do this? Focus on the process and, and, this hat will often sort of stop this one and say, hey, hey, okay, let's not go into speculation about what could we have and what would be super neat. Let's see, look what we have and see how can we make that. So they are sort of balancing each other as well. And the white hat is just the facts saying, okay, do we have the people we need? Is this do we really is this feature do we need it or not is it just just the facts and and separating facts from beliefs well i think that all people won't buy this phone yes but do we know that no but why would a grandma pay three hundred dollars for a phone when she could you know get something that does the same thing well it does it do the same thing let's go out and find out you start to get a list of things that are unchecked stuff that you don't know and then you can say that, okay, we also have some stuff that's checked. We will, we do see that business executives will pay $300, maybe $600 for this, for a phone that does these kinds of things. So that's fine. We know something and there's some things we don't know, but this thing is this neutral and objective. That's also a position people will fall into when you're having a discussion. And the final one, that's the intuitive and emotional. That's a position that a lot of people come into. I don't like this. They feel in it, that's, ah, I don't think this is a good idea. Or they feel, oh, wow, she's talking again. Everything that comes out of her mouth is poetry. These ideas are just fantastic. Well, I know there are some problems with it. I know we haven't really found out, like, some of the things she says that aren't really, you know, fact checked. And it's hard to, but I, I like it. And the thing is, this hat here, that position where you're very emotional, very often, or let's put it this way, that's not usual, that's not a, an accepted part of that traditional discussion. Because we're supposed to be logical when we discuss things, right? But the problem is we're not. So this hat often tries to, if you take that position, you often try to disguise it as as one of the others. Well, I'm just being totally objective here and your idea is crap. Whereas the really reason, the real reason was that you, you don't like that person. You don't like his ideas. He's just a dumbass. But what De Bono invites us to do is to just go through these. Let's go through all of them, but in turn, and all of us at the same time. Let's just, and say, start out here. Just the facts, what do we have here? What's the idea? What do we want it to do? Okay, you had that idea and he helped you out. Okay, that's good. Maybe somewhere later down the line, you have to like give people money based on whose idea it was and how many, how, how long they worked on it something. It's a good idea to have that put down. Okay, so, okay, that's it. How many are we, the four of us? And write that down, fine, let's move on. How do we feel about it? expressively let's get some feelings out of here let's, let's have an idea about what, what do we feel about this project okay because if that that's going to color everything else unless we get it off our chests and the moment we start talking about things and i don't know i don't really i don't know i don't really like it and then i say well is there a reason for that i don't know and that's fine don't be judgmental at that stage just get it out Get the emotion out, and then we can move on. But we know, we know. Everybody says how they feel about that. That, that means we can 
trying to not step on anyone's toes. So let's move on. Everybody try to be positive optimistic. What's the good things about this idea we have in front of us? And what we're doing now, as we move around, move on to being critical, everybody critical. Even though I was negative at this point, I have to be see all the positive things now. I can't just hide them. Because when you're doing this, when you're thinking against each other, what happens is if you can't find an argument, you lose. And if you find an argument that, that you know, supports the other position, you don't want to say that because then you lose. We don't want to create a situation in the creative space where anyone can lose. Nobody loses unless they are not creative, and they're, they're not contributing. And that's what changes with this model. If you come here, you're a bit negative, but you don't provide any positive input here. You seem like it, I mean, that's when you lose. You seem like, if, if you have an opinion, when we're thinking against each other, and you have an opinion, you change your opinion, you're losing. You seem like a loser. You seem like the person who doesn't know what he or she stands for. In this model, it's the other way around. If you can't find anything positive, when everybody's supposed to be positive, then you lose. And then you're not participating. And if you, even though you were very positive here, if you can't find any of the negative things when we're in that stage, you're not contributing. You're not, you're losing. You're not being creative. And it moves on. If you can't find any new stuff to put in there, then you're like, hey, it's just a piece of meat in the chair. You're not being creative. There's a drive all the time to participate and to be creative and to contribute. To put it. If you, when we come back here, and we actually go all the way, often we can go all the way around here, how do we feel now? Ideally, and this process of going around the wheel will make us feel a little different. And hopefully, when we're being, especially if we're starting a new company, everybody should be positive about the product now. It's not, I'm not mandating it. If it's wrong, if the product is wrong, if something's wrong with the whole thing, then maybe it is. Maybe we should do something else. That's really important to find out before we're making too much. But ideally, at least, the emotions will be based on this process and will you know, come a bit further. And if you feel bad, if one of the founders are feeling you know, bad about the project, chances are somebody else, some potential community consumers, so maybe a whole demographic of consumers will also feel bad in some way. So do um, you have any questions as to that? Because I'd like for us to uh, try and use it. Um, and apply it to the ideas that you already have. Any questions? How many people have done this before? Three people have done this before. That's good. Four. One, two, three. Yeah, that's good. And, and there are also other uh, systems. Uh, I mean, last year you mentioned the uh, the animal system. Like six animal models. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sixty animals. Uh, uh, but then not sixty animals. Six animals. But yeah, that's sixty animals. Sixty animals. Better. <laughs> no, but, but anyway, the animal system. That's but then you, you get a role and you keep that role. Yeah. You stay in that role. That's to have a good mix of of viewpoints within the group over an extended period of time which is different from the bonus six hats in that that's more of sort of a persistent thing, whereas this is just, a, you're switching through all the uh, ways of thinking through, like over a course of a very short period of time to evaluate one idea, okay? But usually getting one idea up there, that's usually not so hard. So with, between the, three people or whatever it is working on your project, I think you should have an idea really quickly. And by using that that system, you should really quickly be able to <clears throat> find some good, bad points and challenging it in a way that maybe you haven't done before. So um, I'm 
unsure. Should we take maybe a 15 minute break and then come back and then get together in the groups that you have and when you do the thing that you do? Uh, and if you, um, yeah. How, how many here are just alone because the, their, their partner or partners are not here at all? Nobody, everybody, one. You don't have somebody to. On the integration project? Yeah, on the integration I don't have any teammates yet. Yeah. No. Okay. But you have an idea, each of you. No. But you, so, so you, foreseeably, you could work together. I'm not saying you should, but you could. At least for this task, you could work, you could work together with some idea that either you think of during the 15 minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. That's what I do. I just, it's like idea diarrhea up here. Comes all the time. Can't stop it. Okay. But um, yeah, okay, 15 minute break and uh, we'll be back and we'll throw some hats around.
Um, just gonna say a couple of things. Um, I think now you should get. A, I think the first thing you could do is just Google uh, Edward de Bono's six hacks. I'm gonna go in and jump back just so you have. If you find that graphic, that's fantastic. If you don't, that's okay. You find something, but where it says all the sort of mindsets you go through, right? And I'll go around, and you'll just start with uh, start with the uh, start with the white hat. Get all the facts and the figures. Get everything on the, about your idea, and then move around. And I'll come in at some point, and and listen to what you have, and and we'll see uh, if you're doing it right. Which I hope you do. If not, we'll adjust it then. Um, and uh, because a lot of you will be just two or three people, and it's easy, as I said over here, when you're just two or three people, it's easy to miss like a variable or miss out on something. So um, I'm going to go in and, and, and talk to you, engage, try to put on some hats myself. Maybe uh, Moses would want to do that. Maybe uh, maybe Simon want to do it. And uh, for you guys in uh, in Spain, in Granada, I think uh, I'm going to come up with a good solution for you as well. You should also try to do it, but um, and then send me some results. We should all write a little some notes after this, but I'll get back to that as soon as I've uh, actually, you know, done some thinking. Um, and um, yeah, there's also an app for those of you who have. Uh, I hope it's still working. It's pretty old. I don't know if it's updated, but um, as I remember, it's free or close to free. So uh, go and download that if you want. Um, and then I think just uh, just uh, get to work. And then I'll talk some more about creativity and touch more about that. What should I say? Um, individual creativity and how you use how to. You'll flex your creative muscles and, and keep being creative on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, just uh, yeah. So just get in groups and then start talking again. Like I, before you were so rudely interrupted. Okay, I'll do that for <coughs> I think 30 minutes. So yeah, around 40 and then two. Yeah, quarter past two, and then we'll. With a bit more lecture stuff. Have you seen this game of code? Which is this one you were saying? Uh,